Okay, Michael, we're good to go. Welcome to everyone and thank you all for joining us uh, for this special event, which focuses on the situation today in the Americas and a constructive path forward. The dialogue is very pleased to launch the 10th policy report in its four decade history, the case for renewed cooperation in a troubled hemisphere towards the ninth summit of the Americas. Unlike the multiple reports that the dialogue regularly produces on its particular program priorities, such as the role of remittances, Chinese finance in the region, or climate change in Central America, this report is wide ranging and comprehensive. It is also the product of a collaborative and consensual effort and reflects the perspective of the organization and specifically the dialogue's diverse membership of some 130 individuals from the hemisphere and Spain who are listed in the back of the report. Although not every member agrees with every statement or recommendation in the text, most endorse the report's content and tone and the thrust of its recommendations. The chief input for the report comes from deliberations of the Saul Linowitz Forum, named after our founder, that brings together members every two years to review the agenda in the Americas and to come up with practical ideas to address the main challenges. For the first, and I hope the last time, the forum met virtually in late June of last year. There were three working groups involving over half of our dialogue members that prepared background papers and, uh, for discussion. First was on democracy and the rule of law, second on social and economic challenges, and the third on health and the pandemic. The overarching framework for the forum and for this report has been on cooperation in the hemisphere. It is also a central pillar of the dialogue's core mission. The report has six, section, has six sections democracies under threat, mixed results on social and economic development, health and the lasting impact of the pandemic, the ongoing migration and refugee crises, rebooting hemispheric cooperation, back to basics, which includes an assessment of the Biden administration's regional policy to date. And finally, recommendations for a path forward. The report was reviewed by members and finalized before the Ukraine tragedy, although there is a reference in the forward. The lesson for this hemisphere is that collective action in defense of common interests and common values is still possible. If anything, the crisis only underscores the urgency of greater cooperation in the Americas. There's been other updates on other issues in the report, such as migration policy, that of course were not, conclude, were not included because we already had closed um, any uh, additional input on the, uh, for the report. The report, as you'll see, has no illusions about the difficulties facing the hemisphere today. The outlook is not an altogether cheerful one. We believe, however, that the analysis is honest and realistic. And we are convinced that it's hard to fashion a roadmap without a proper diagnosis first. In some respects, the report is closer to the dialogue's first one in early 1983 called America's at the Crossroads in a very difficult environment, a very difficult time for the hemisphere. In contrast to the one we produced right before the first summit of the Americas in 1994 that was called Community and Convergence in the Americas. Clearly, a lot has changed since then. But it is important to underscore the determination and the resilience shown by Latin Americans in the 1980s and 1990s. And there are signs that such qualities are ready to be activated again with a new generation to tackle today's challenges. While all dialogue reports have devoted a lot of attention to US policy towards the region, as this one does as well, this report highlights far more than previous ones, the profound governance challenges confronting the United States. In a serious report on the Americas in 2022, 
it is hard to ignore the significant risks to democracy in the United States and the implications for fashioning a credible and effective foreign policy, including towards Latin America and the Caribbean. We very much hope that the report will be a useful reference and input to the upcoming Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles, California in the first week of June, where there's a, an important opportunity to focus on a set of specific issues that demand enhanced cooperation. We recognize that many challenges can only be met by national and local governments and actors, but others can benefit enormously from working, working more closely together across national boundaries. We realize that that task is not easy today, but we also insist that it's crucial to press on and, and try to achieve greater cooperation. If the report helps stimulate a frank and productive debate and discussion among relative actors, then it will have served a useful purpose. With that background, I'm very happy to introduce the five sup superb speakers we have for today's session who will be presenting and commenting on the report. First, we'll have a presentation of the report and some of the ideas contained in the report by the dialogues two distinguished co-chairs, President Laudich and Chiya, who is a co-chair of the dialogue, who was uh, elected as the first female president of, of Costa Rica uh, in 2010. President Chinchilla uh, served in other positions in the Costa Rican government. She's been very, very active on a number of initiatives, both at the regional level, at the global level. And um, she, of course, speaks uh, widely at a number of forums and has taught at a number of universities uh, in the region, such as the uh, Instituto de Tecnológico de Monterrey and also the University uh, of Sao Paulo. So we're very, very delighted and honored to have President Chuchilla join us today um, to get us started on the report. And we're also very happy that Ambassador Tom Shannon, um, our, the Dialogue's uh, second co-chair, um, will also be sharing his thoughts on some of the themes uh, in the report as well. Ambassador Shannon uh, spent over 30 years in the Foreign Service, most recently as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs in the State Department. He was previously a senior advisor to the Secretary uh, after a four-year term as U.S. Ambassador to Brazil. Ambassador Shannon was also Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs. And before that, Special Assistant to the President, Senior Director for Western Hemisphere Affairs at the National uh, Security Council. He's also had very a number of very high posts in the Foreign Service, and he's now currently a Senior Advisor uh, to, for Arnold uh, and Porter. And we're really thrilled to have Ambassador uh, Shannon with us. Uh, following the two presentations, we'll, we're going to have commentaries from three uh, dialogue members and very good friends, and we're extremely fortunate to have them with us today. Uh, Donna Reinick, who um, is the longest serving uh, dialogue member with us today, who joined the dialogue as a member in 2005. She currently serves as a member of the dialogue's board of directors. She is a senior vice president of corporate affairs at the Royal Caribbean Group. And prior to joining the Royal Caribbean, she was president of Boeing Brazil, Boeing Latin America, and Boeing uh, Canada. She was also vice president of global public policy and public affairs and government affairs at PepsiCo. And uh, before her very, uh, very successful career in the private sector, of course, she served in a number of very senior diplomatic posts, including being ambassador to Brazil, Venezuela, Bolivia, and the Dominican Republic. So we're thrilled to have um, Donna with us today uh, as well. Uh, we're also very, very happy to have with us Sylvia Escobar, who joined as a member in, in 2020. She's a, uh, she's a more recent member. She also uh, serves on uh, the Dialogue's Board of Directors. She is the strategic president of EPS uh, Sanitas Com uh, Comprehensive Health Group and the former president of Organización Turpol having served the company for more than 15 years in different managerial positions. 
Um, she's had a very a number of other very high level uh, positions in the private sector. And um, Sylvia has also worked in the public sector, uh, holding lots of positions. She was the main economist for the Colombian Resident Mission of the World Bank and also worked in the National Planning uh, Department. So we're extremely happy to have um, um, Sylvia Escobar with us uh, as well. And we'll also be uh, joined um, uh, later on by uh, Tabata Amaral, who is a Brazilian politician and education activist. She's currently a fed federal deputy for the Democratic Labor Party, representing the state of Sao Paulo. And um, throughout 2019, she was a vice leader of the P PDT and its associated political a coalition. She's very active on education issues, on women's rights issues, and technology issues. She graduated from Harvard University with a degree in astrophysics and political scientists and political science. And uh, Tabata joined the dialogue uh, same year as Sylvia in 2020. And uh, she'll, we also expect her to be joining us and sharing some thoughts uh, about the report. Uh, following uh, uh, all of our speakers, we will be opening up uh, to the audience uh, for questions. We invite participants to submit questions using the Q&A function in Zoom or by call or by emailing at meetings at the dialogue.org. Um, and before giving the floor over to President Chia to get us started, I want to give special thanks to everybody who helped with the report and also for this event with uh, gratitude to Denise Yanovich. Uh, Cape Lancet and Gaston Ocampo. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to President Chinchilla. Uh, thank you, Mike, and congratulations for a great report, which captures quite well the discussions that took place during the last Linois Forum. It is a pleasure for me to be in this panel with Tom, Donna, and Sylvia. Um, as you mentioned initially, uh, the report presents a precise but also a honest and realistic overview of the current situation in our region, uh, a region that was hit hard by the pandemic crisis and with serious unresolved structural problems. But at the same time, the report highlights some opportunities that if properly dimensioned could bring more prosperity and instability of our region. So let me comment on the report's most important contents in relation to the economic and social impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and their political consequences, which is a big part of this uh, document. Um, the document, as I mentioned, starts by recognizing that Latin America and the Caribbean was severely impacted by the pandemic. The regional GDP experience is worse contraction in decades, reaching minus 6.8% in 2020, the most significant downturn, downturn among the emerging markets. This was the natural result of the lockdowns in countries exposed to large informal labor markets, a drastic reduction of tourism and of global demand of commodities. Despite some contracyclical policies, aimed at increasing public spending, the social consequences were also devastating. According to the United Nations Economic Commission on Latin America, the overall poverty in the region increased from 30.5% in 2019 to 33.7% in 2020, reaching a total of 209 million persons and inequality rose by nearly 3%, further widening the already enormous disparities in both income and unemployment. Moreover, a critical tool for growth, innovation, and social mobility like education was hardly impacted. According to the World Bank, learning losses caused by school closures could amount to more than 150 days with an economic cost of $1.7 trillion. Even before the pandemic, school dropouts were another critical problem in the region where four out of 10 children don't finish their high school education. 
So the document clearly presents how the effects of the pandemic were aggravated given the previous vulnerabilities that the region presented in previous chapters of the Linowitz Forum. We had warned of this kind of poor structural conditions that in this occasion explain once again uh, the very uh, critical results of uh, this uh, crisis. But the report also expresses concern about the country's limited margin of action to respond to the huge challenges ahead due to the high fiscal deficits, increasing inflationary pressures, rising levels of public debt and capital outflows. These economic and social consequences will eventually affect political and institutional developments in many countries and could translate into further deterioration of the state of democracy all over the region. As the document points out, broad dissatisfaction with government performance, deficient public services, rule of law breaches, and corruption uh, are on the rise. Similarly, populist and authoritarian leaders are gaining ground, which entails the risk of concentration of power in their hands by taking over state institutions, limiting judicial independence, and attacking the free press. The report is particularly concerned about the increased influence of the military in some countries. They have been called by civilian leaders to step in and assume functions beyond the traditional ones of security and defense. For example, participating in the managing of state-owned enterprises and other government agencies, or becoming the final arbiters of political crisis. However, as I initially mentioned, the document also highlights some promising signs, and I want to conclude with mentioning some of them. In economic and social terms, there are some remarkable opportunities. Latin American entrepreneurship continue showing strong signs of vitality and capacity to innovate. As early of 2022, for instance, there were 27 Latin American startup companies valued at $1 billion or more Whereas in 2018, there were only four. Secondly, it also recognizes that due to their geographical proximity and close economic ties to the United States, and following the disruption brought about by the pandemic and the growing tensions between Beijing and Washington, Latin America and the Caribbean countries are well positioned to gain from a process of nearshoring. If both the United States and Latin America and the Caribbean take advantage of this opportunity, both parties can win. It will boost opportunities for further economic integration and growth and could improve US soft power in the region. In number three, in political terms and compared with other moments in Latin American history, the region has shown considerable resilience and vitality, something that Mike also mentioned at the beginning. It remains the most democratic region in the developing world, and the vast majority of governments are democratically elected. There are also some uh, grounds for hope when it comes to the revitalization that civil society is experiencing. Across the hemisphere, many citizens are mobilized, fighting corruption, defending human rights, investigating and shining a light on abuses and protesting um, sharp social and economic inequalities and injustice, environmental degradation and authoritarian rule. The report recognizes that civil society is robust and actively engaged in shaping the public agenda. Young people in particular are taking sharp aim at long standing elite privileges and demanding greater inclusion in political and economic affairs. To finalize, 
The report presents some recommendations. Among them is the need of fostering hemispheric coordination and cooperation to accelerate the region's social and economic recovery, bolster the train and investment integration, combat corruption and organized crime, and address the ongoing deterioration of democratic institution and the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Chinchi. Uh, um, turn it over to Ambassador Shannon. Thank you very much, Michael. And I'm delighted to have this opportunity to be with all of you today to discuss the Dialogues Policy Report. As Michael noted, this was the product of our Linowitz Forum and the contributions of all the members of the Dialogue who were able to participate in a far ranging discussion of the challenges and the opportunities facing the Americas as we head into uh, deeper into, into the 21st century. And President Chin Chi, I think, has done a very uh, eloquent and elegant job of laying out uh, the fundamental aspects of that report, uh, including the different sections of it that focus uh, on democracy in the hemisphere, that focus on the impact of the pandemic on social, economic development and political development, uh, with a very special focus uh, on democracy, on public health institutions, on education and development in the region. And then of course, uh, expanding a bit to look at the issue of migration and refugees with the effort made to highlight migration as a regional phenomenon that requires regional solutions. Then looking at the importance of rebooting our hemisphere by going back to basics and, and affect looking for ways to enhance cooperation and collaboration by trying to revitalize and rebuild those inter-American institutions that have played such an important role in shaping and forming uh, the Americas as we know them, especially the Organization of American States and the Inter-American Development Bank, but all with a view towards the Summit of the Americas this June in Los Angeles, when the United States will have an opportunity to host the first uh, really uh, pandemic effort to address uh, uh, the, the challenges in the hemisphere uh, since COVID emerged as a major scourge of, of our societies. But as President Chinchia highlighted, uh, both in the recommendations that are, are being made to the Biden administration and to others about the substance of, of the summit uh, and looking back and analyzing the impact of the pandemic in the region, what is striking for me are not just the challenges, but the opportunities. And they're not just the, uh, the, 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 the problems that the hemisphere has faced, but really the resilience that it has shown in the process of doing so. And the fact that this is a region that has an, uh, an enduring vitality. It is a region that is committed to its democratic institutions and its democratic processes, but is in the process of reshaping them in ways that are going to be important for the century that we live in. And what I mean by that is that it is really a region that is focused on using democratic governance <clears throat> to create democratic states and democratic societies, and is increasingly focused on the ability of states to be able to provide the resources and the opportunities necessary so that people can not only have a voice in national destiny, but a voice in individual destiny. And in this regard, I really believe that we have a region that is not only unique in terms of its commitment to democracy, unique not only in terms of its commitment uh, to common economic understandings, a region that is uh, unique in its commitment to integration and using trade as a driver of, of economic growth and development, but also uh, societies and countries that realize that democracy to be meaningful and relevant to its citizens must produce outcomes that have an impact on everyday lives. And this is gonna be the leadership challenge uh, that the region faces as it heads towards the summit of the Americas and beyond, which is how can we show that our democratic institutions and processes are more than just processes, that they are actually ways of structuring the state so that it can perform the necessary actions to, to foster the social and economic development of the peoples of the Americas. And for me, for, that, for me, this is the exciting moment that we're in right now. With all the challenges that we have to face, uh, with everything that has to be understood 
and addressed because of the pandemic and because of its economic consequences through the education systems, through the degradation of public health systems, and through the, the questioning of, of state capacity. We have a, a deeply empowered citizenry, which is looking to its political leadership and to its states and its institutions to provide the kind of answers necessary to advance our societies. And in this regard, I think the dialogue has performed a singular and important service in highlighting what has worked and what hasn't worked uh, over the last several years, highlighting the importance of political leadership at this point in time, but especially highlighting the importance of cooperation and collaboration and calling on the governments that will be meeting in Los Angeles in June to live up to the demands that are being made of them from their own citizens. And so, Michael, it was a tremendous pleasure to be able to cooperate with you in this, your final report as a dialogue president. Um, uh, you have been a important uh, and singular force for creating understanding and cooperation, common purpose and common action in our hemisphere. And for this, we are grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom. And thank you for those very nice, nice words. Um, I appreciate it. And, and thanks to both you and President Gia for getting us off to a great start. Uh, we'll now turn to our, our, our uh, commentators, but, but I just want to um, invite everybody again that if they have questions, feel free to use the Q&A function in Zoom or uh, send an email to meetings at the dialogue.org and we'll be happy to include your questions in, in the discussion. Uh, but first, let me turn it over to, to Donna Reinick. Donna? Thank you, Michael, President Chinchilla and Tom Shannon. I've been asked to speak about democracy, US policy in the region and US domestic issues and Venezuela. So let me start with the first Summit of the Americas in 1994, when I had the pleasure of serving as coordinator for policy. And the principal responsibility of that job was to work with uh, counterparts in the region to draw up the substantive agenda as opposed to the logistical agenda, the substantive agenda, the initiatives that were going to emerge from that uh, summit. And as we conducted the negotiation, um, negotiating sessions across the hemisphere, you would frequently hear the US group say things to um, try to align ourselves with the concerns of the region so that you would hear people from within the region say, well, our healthcare system really is dysfunctional. And people on the US side would comment, well, we also have a lot of people in the United States with inadequate healthcare. Or you would hear people uh, complain that um, the education system was, was not preparing their citizens well for the challenges of the, of the end of the 20th century. And we would reply that we also had poor public education in many places in the United States. That's what we would tell our counterparts. But among ourselves, we really knew that we were superior, right? We, we had this figured out. We had good education, we had great health care, and basically we were going to pull the rest of the hemisphere along. Not all of us felt that way, I have to say. I like to count myself among, the, myself among those who didn't. But even the least cynical of us would not have believed that three decades later, we would share most closely with the rest of the hemisphere the threat to the stability of our democratic governments. And by the same token, while we often commented on how Latin America was the most economically unequal region of the world, we failed to recognize how inequality was increasing in the United States. I think these realizations and these understandings of how closely the United States really does share the same issues, the same problems as the rest of the hemisphere is in itself the case and the hope for renewed cooperation. A few points I'd like to make. First of all, the authorian trends we see in the region are not about ideology. The rhetoric may reflect more of a left or a right orientation, but the, tastic, the tactics are the same regardless of what point of view they claim to represent the tactics of repression and intimidation. Secondly, elections 
as the report quick, correctly points out, are the sine qua non of democracy. But what we see now are democratically elected leaders, leaders who came to office through acknowledged free and fair elections, who are using that electoral mandate to justify their tactics to reduce the democratic space in their countries and to undermine democratic institutions. We're not talking about Nicaragua, Cuba, Venezuela in this case. We're talking about democratically elected leaders recognized as such. Thirdly, we were delighted in 1994 when we posted the photos of the leaders who would participate in that summit to note that in contrast to the 1968 meeting, there were no leaders wearing military uniforms. All of them had on civilian business suits. One even was, was wearing a dress, only one, but at least one. Right now, we don't have that stark contrast between civilian leaders on one side and military on the other. There's a whole spectrum of varying degrees of democracy. And as President Chinchilla correctly pointed out, in some cases, that military role is growing in areas that for 2022 might be unexpected. I want to note one point that the report makes uh, about the OAS focus and the real value add that I think the OAS can bring to uh, strengthening democratic cooperation and democratic institutions. There are many organizations in this hemisphere that are focused on other aspects of development, other aspects of uh, economic growth. I think the OAS has a unique value in terms of uh, um, democracy uh, promotion and um, development. And I would encourage the OAS to um, not try to be all things um, to all address all the needs of the hemisphere, but to focus on democracy. Building democracy takes time. We often say that keys to democracy are uh, education, administration of justice. It takes a generation to change an education system. It takes years to implement a judicial reform um, that will really take hold. That's gonna take a while, but I think there's something we can do right now. And I wanna challenge everyone um, on this call to do something right now. And that is to support independent, objective journalism in the hemisphere. Not only because the dialogue had a program about this this morning, but because um, this is the key to creating the space, providing the transparency that these longer term um, solutions to um, the problems of, of democratic fragility need to address. Finally, one word about Venezuela. When I served in the embassy in Venezuela for the first time between um, 1987 and 1989, a book was published called Mas y Mejor Democracia, More and Better Democracy. And we from the political section wrote a cable asking, would more democracy necessarily be better? I think what we have learned in the intervening years is that not necessarily, it needs to be nurtured, it needs to be fostered, and we need to be diligent, not just in Venezuela, not just in uh, all the countries of the hemisphere outside the United States, but here as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Donna. I uh, really appreciate those comments. Uh, we're now joined by Tabata Amaral from, uh, from Sao Paulo. And uh, we want to welcome her warmly and thank her for joining us. And uh, we'll first go to her, if that's OK, and then hear from Silvia uh, Escobar. So um, let me turn it over to uh, Tabata. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real honor to be here speaking to all of you who have accomplished so much, who have done so much for our Latin America. And I'm really honored to be part of the dialogue and I just want to thank everyone in the name of Michael Shifter and uh, thank you for the incredible work you have been doing for all these years. Our region owes you a lot and well, you can always count on me. Uh, for those who don't, don't know me and who are not from Brazil, my name is Tabata Amaral. I'm 28 years old. I'm a political scientist, an education activist, 
I come from public schools. Um, I was born and raised in one of the poorest regions of Sao Paulo. Today, I work as a congresswoman representing the Socialist Brazilian Party, uh, my state in the National Congress. And I say those things because representation means a lot to me. Our Congress is really far away from our population. And I say that because you don't, you barely see women, you barely see black people, you barely see young people. And I believe that when our Congress looks a little bit more um, like our population, we will have uh, national politics, politics actually caring about what uh, is important to people in their daily lives. Um, just to also say that, sorry for this, uh, our cabinet is really close to the airport. Uh, I also want to compliment President Chinchilla, Ambassador Shannon, Donna Hernak, and Silva Escobar. It's a real honor to be able to learn from you as well. Um, since I have just a few minutes, I would like to take to bring some uh, topics from what it has been it has been to us to as an education activist, as a young leader, to bring to be in Brazil in those last three years, especially with the pandemic. It's really important that we take a break sometimes, uh, think and discuss uh, solutions to our Americas. Of course, that. Uh, this increase in populism that we have been seeing the whole world uh, is not only in our region, but I think we have much more to suffer from this, much more to lose because we are so unequal, because our democracies are younger, and I think that forums like these is, are extremely important. Um, I'm sure this is true for all, all countries, but in Brazil, uh, if I had to make a summary of what the pandemic meant to us, COVID-19 uh, was responsible for putting light into, but also uh, deepening all the inequalities we had. Socioeconomic inequality, inequality in the access to education, inequality in the access to health. And we were extremely unlucky to face this really hard time with a negationist, with a, a populist leader like Bolsonaro. And Brazil has lost almost 700,000 lives and scientists have concluded that at least some of those hundreds of uh, million lives could have been saved if we had a president that actually cared about its people. So times have been really hard in Brazil and of course that the poorest suffered the more. So just so you have some numbers, uh, one quarter of Brazilians were under uh, the poverty line during the pandemic. And when we talk about education, 5 million students were left out without any access to education. And many of them could not study because they didn't have internet access. They didn't have the access to equipments. Um, in Congress, I'm part of the bancada, as we say in Portuguese, the group of MPs who fight for education. We are small, but a very brave group. And since the pandemic uh, arrived, we have been fighting. I was the rapporteur to this project to make sure that 18 million students would have access to internet, would have access to equipment. Unfortunately, and that this has been happening with many fights, the government for ideological reasons uh, fought against the project from the very beginning which meant that we had to go to court for two times. We had to bring down a veto. And only two years later, after we first introduced this bill, um, states are, are just now receiving the funds to bring internet access and to distribute equipment. And I say that because, well, in 2022, internet access is the same and is really much related to the access of, uh, to, inter to education. But in Brazil, it has been like that for in many areas. When we talk about the environment, women's rights, the fight against racism, just to name a few. We have to spend so much time and so much energy, not only to advance some projects, but to make sure that our institutions are holding strong and that we don't see more and more backlashes. And that is true to all of those areas. So this is just one example. If we, had, if we had not the government fighting against the group of parliamentaries who work in the educational area, 
these 18 million students would have had received the access to internet and the access to equipment two years ago. And now we don't, we don't have the exact number um, as of now, but we know that dropout rates have increased between two and three times in Brazil. And I can only imagine how many students would still be in school, would still be dreaming about their futures if uh, we were not living such a tragedy uh, in basic education as we are in Brazil. Of course, I am optimistic. I think that comes with the age and also with the fact that, well, my parents could not finish uh, high school and I was able to get a degree from Harvard and to really dream and like uh, pave my future. But I know I am an exception because I had opportunities in education that people in my community did not have access to, that people in my family did not have access to. But the fact that I know that it is possible, that it is worth it, and that maybe for the first time, people from, um, from the backgrounds I come from, women, people, uh, Black people, and just to name a few, are occupying the, their place in politics make me optimistic for the future. And just um, uh, a second and last comment. I am very worried about this year's election. Uh, we are living a very polarized and violent uh, moment in our politics. I myself have received many threats, life threats, because things are so violent right now. And I'm a woman, which make things worse in terms of uh, political violence. And I have also been worried because Bolsonaro has been increasing in the last polls. And well, I do think we keep, can be arrogant and take it for granted that he is defeated. And to be sincere, I'm not sure if Brazilian democracy can sur will survive a second mandate of Bolsonaro. I know you have uh, spoken a lot about this today, but uh, the number of military members has uh, more than doubled in the government. Today, we have the 5th, 8th anniversary of the military coup, and the defense ministry went out to say that 64 coup is a milestone in political evolution. And that's something that would be simply unbelievable and unimaginable a few years ago. So if you see how much uh, the media has been persecuted, how much the opposition has been persecuted, how much uh, serious institutions like IBAMA, which is responsible for protecting the environment, have been had, and, and also the federal police have had their directors uh, removed because they were ideological, just because uh, they had a different position from the federal government. I think those things are really scary and that we should be aware that uh, this year's election is really important for the future of our country and for the future of democracy in our country. I know that uh, the ideals of, uh, of democracy have not been reached in Brazil and in many other countries in Latin America, but those are the only ideals uh, I know that are worth fighting for. And the response we, we have to give is to deepen uh, and deeper our democracy. And to finalize, one thing that scares me a lot too, is that uh, since we became a democracy again in Brazil around 30 years ago, uh, this is the election in which the lowest rate of young people are going to vote. And I think this is, um, this task is, is to me, but it's also for all of you. How can we make sure that this engagement and all, how much young people care about the world, how can we make sure that all this movement is not only out of politics, out of partisan formal politics, but how can we convince uh, younger people that uh, all this energy and all this movement should be uh, uh, turned turn in and should be used to uh, promote, promote political change. So uh, I think those are my comments. Uh, I really hope that the next time we meet, maybe after this year's election in October, I will be able to tell you that, well, we have defeated Bolsonaro uh, and we'll need a very broad coalition in order to do that. I have been working very hard towards uh, that goal. It's not easy at all, but I hope that I can meet with you again and say, okay, I need your help now because we have an entire country to rebuild environmentally speaking, in education, in health, in security, 
and we need all the best minds and ideas in order to do that. Again, thank you so much. For, sorry for the English. <laughs> it has been 10 years since I don't use English uh, daily, but it's a real honor to be here with you. And you can always count uh, on me in Brazil to be a defender. I don't know if I you can say that in English of democracy. Thank you Great. so much. Thank you, Tabitha. I really, really uh, appreciate it. Thank you. I know you're very busy, but that was a really important perspective and your English is perfect. And we really, uh, really very grateful to you. So thank you. And uh, we're, we're honored to have you as a member of the dialogue and we're gonna continue to work with you and engage in, on the important issues that you, you've you talked about. So uh, thank you so much and good luck. Uh, thank you. Let me turn now for final commentary to, uh, to Silvia Escobar. Silvia, thank you so much for, for joining us and look forward to your, your thoughts. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, thank you, Tavata. I loved what you said, and I, I am going to refer to this new generation of, of, of people who is, who is asking for a different uh, government ways of, of making things. And thank you so much for your intervention. Uh, we will always be here to support you. Um, I would like to tell everybody before uh, starting how honored I feel Michael and Laura and Thomas and everyone, Dona, it's a pleasure to be here. I feel um, that it's an honor to be commenting Michael's final report, not only because it is his last, but because I really enjoyed reading it and found it extremely accurate and useful for governments and people in the Americas in this challenging days after all the COVID impacts and recently with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which will bring many changes in, in the way we are doing things. And thank you, Michael, we will miss you. And thank you team in the dialogue for a great report. I will start by saying that there is a phrase that caught my attention and that summarizes in my view what underlies the different problems that we are facing right now in the world and in this case in our continent. And I quote, governments have been unable to come together with a sense of common purpose. I really think that that is the main purpose. I do believe that greater cooperation would make a real difference in people's life. And I do think that independently of the specific decisions that are to be taken in each of the eight recommendations of the report, um, and, 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 I, and I really, Michael, a coincide, I don't know if that's the word, in, in the recommendations, I, I really think they, they, they are what the, the world would should be doing now, and especially in Latin America. It, the private, I mean, the important thing is that partnerships involving governments, involving the private sector and the civil society will really achieve our inter-American common goals. If we do not work together, we will not achieve that. Since time is short, I cannot be able to comment on all the issues. I would love to do so, especially on the, all the things on gender, many of the things that Tabata was, was, was talking about. But as suggested by the team, I will try to comment on the political situation in Colombia and its relation to threats and democracy. Colombia is being, being challenged by the coming elections in May 29, Laura. You're having in this, this, this uh, Sunday, we are having in Sunday in two months from now. Um, it is a very unique social and economic moment. We have unique growth, GDP growth, but we also have unique inflation rates and employment rates. So, so it really could be seen as a threat to democracy. In this few minutes, I will give you a summary on the political situation, which arrives from a lack of understanding and commitment on many subjects that were addressed in the dialogues report. First, Colombia has historically been governed by right leaning rulers and has a tradition of strong institutions that makes it the oldest democracy in the region, as we always say. However, Along with the older geopolitical rise addressed by the report in its different chapters, we come from a 
period of social discontent. And the right-wing president, Iván Duque, has the highest disapproval ratings in Colombia's president uh, has seen in decades. More than 75% of Colombians disapprove of their leader. Second, the distrust, this distrust in government and institution, along with growing income inequality, resurgence of violence, corruption cases, and the new generation of voters that here are represented by Tabata, uh, uh, seeking changes in leadership and in their approach to climate change, to education, to diversity, is changing the political atmosphere to seek for more leftist movements at this moment. And Colombia is not only the only situation, Peru, Chile, Honduras are confronting this status quo. Third, in this opening for alternative candidates, there is a strong leftist and former guerrilla member who is focused on changing the model that the country has had for more than 20 years. Among these proposals, he calls for structural reforms in the health system, which is one of the best in the world, I think, pensions. He's, he's, he's looking to distribute savings in the private funds, mining and oil industry. He, he, he's saying he will stop new uh, new uh, findings in this industry affecting more than 30 percent of the exports nowadays among others most of his proposals in my opinion not only endanger years of advance in economic and social development but it also adversely affect private industries in this sector consequently many business people and investors are spooked uh, with this campaign uh, this, however, do not, pose a, do not pose a threat to democracy if we keep institutions strong. That is why we have to keep working on what Donna and Michael and uh, Laura were saying about the importance of defending uh, democracy. This, however, stagnate and reverse advances in development with no real solutions beyond words and false promises. That is the problem. And why have we come to that? Because we, the government, have been unable to listen, to understand changes, to come together and work together, to communicate and to deliver around every issue so well described in this report. For those interested in the expected results, there are two months yet to know who will win the elections, but that will depend on how the other possible candidates, center and right wing, will be able to communicate to the public on this non-rational, but rather emotional political area. Let me end by saying that I don't believe that democracy is at stake in Colombia. And I believe in the resilience of the country and the opportunities in the long term. What I do think is that any government, and it doesn't matter if it's left or right, it, it is not, as Donna said, it's not a term of, of left or right. They have to make the changes analyzed in the report that range from democracy to deforestation, energy transition, migration, education, health, economic, social re recovery with strong anti-corruption actions. They have to be addressed by the new government in ways that people see real changes in their way of living and then enhance our country's growth and competitiveness. This cannot be done without hemispheric collaboration, regional integration, and strong leaderships. We all in the Americas do need to come together with a sense of common purpose in these matters, defending and preserving democratic institutions to achieve the transformations that people are urging for. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sylvia, for those great comments and really, really appreciate it. Um, we have uh, limited time. What I what I propose to do perhaps is maybe just to um, read some of the questions that we've gotten and pose the questions to um, maybe start to see whether either Sylvia or Donna has any responses and then turn to uh, Ambassador Shannon and President Chia for also any reactions to the questions and also some final reflections that they would like to, to share based on what they've heard from the commentators and, and, and the questions. 
A um, couple of questions have to do with the summit specifically. Um, uh, basically, one is, you know, who should be uh, invited? Um, we, we did uh, one question asked that we did, you know, in, in, in Panama and in Peru, uh, Cuba was present. Um, should there, should that continue that sort of more inclusionary uh, approach? Or should there be, um, should it be, you know, only those governments that are democratically elected, which is clearly not the case with Cuba um, and or Nicaragua or Venezuela? What do what the panelists think about that? And also um, a question of what would be considered a, um, you know, success for the summit? What should we, what would be the measure of success? Um, there's another question on, um, on sort of on the, on the nature of democracy, um, what's what's meant by more democracy? Um, you know, are, are there certain examples that can be po pointed to where uh, how you nurture and, and foster uh, more effective uh, and higher quality democracies? Is the U.S.'s uh, Brian Zapata asks, is the U.S.'s model of democracy the best? Um, what? what may be uh, missing in some of the Latin American examples. There's a question from Olivia Chase, who is there's been a significant social dislocation globally. Uh, how do developing countries begin to find innovative ways to fund domestic social programs and institutions post COVID and, uh, and potential climate change, natural disasters? Uh, another participant also asked more about climate change than any of the panelists on um, what they consider to be the uh, top climate change priority for Venice for, uh, for the region. Um, and then finally, on the uh, situation in Venezuela, President Biden has announced extraordinary measures regarding the critical minerals and US strategic oil reserves uh, in the context of Russia's uh, invasion uh, of Ukraine and uh, the broken relationship with, with Russia. Um, should the U.S. Uh, continue to pursue a rapprochement to, uh, to the Maduro regime uh, in Caracas? Um, that is another question. And then finally, what role could corporations in the private sector play to build more collaboration to support education and social and economic mobility in general? So you see there are a set of uh, issues and concerns. And let me just turn briefly to... Um, Donna and Sylvia, and then I'll turn to President Shannon and uh, President uh, Ambassador Shannon and President Tuchia for for final remarks. So, Donna, do you want to um, address any of those? And I'll address the easy ones and leave the others for okay. Sylvia. Um, with regard to what a successful summit would look like, I actually asked that question just yesterday of a, a State Department official. Um, because, of course, in 1994, we had one single trademark initiative, which was to build the free trade area of the Americas. Mm -hmm. And I, this is not the, the time uh, for that kind of, I think, uh, broad ranging initiative. Um, and uh, the State Department uh, official said, we don't want to over promise and under deliver. I do think there is a possibility that they were over under promise though. I mean, I think there does need to be some energy developed around some of the, the um, uh, objectives they sent for the summit, some of the areas that the summit's going to consider. And I think if they just looked at sort of smaller, maybe um, sub-regional um, uh, activities, um, and the question about climate change, I mean, there are, existential climate issues facing the islands of the Caribbean. Um, so looking at what the sub-regions may have top of mind and trying to develop initiatives that might not be hemispheric wide, but would certainly have implications for the hemisphere for, further down the road. And I'll just answer the other question about what is more democracy. I, I um, maybe should have stated that the conclusion that more democracy wasn't necessarily better was not that more democracy was necessarily worse but that it was certainly insufficient. It may be the sine qua non, but it is not enough. And democracy has to deliver. Sylvia talked about some of the ways that, um, that society has to come together. 
um, to help democracy deliver. It's not a government only activity, but you know, people have to believe they have a stake in democracy, that their lives are better in a democratic um, system than they um, would be otherwise. And that, you know, we've seen the Latino barometer surveys up and down about the support for democracy in the hemisphere. And there are just too many times when people don't believe that um, they're, the best system for them is democracy. And no, I don't believe the US system of government is best for everyone. Parliamentary systems work quite well in some countries. Some countries in Latin America have toyed with that model occasionally, but it, um, it, it's worked for us for two, over 250 years. And while it's not, um, it, it's not perfect, um, it, it has proven to be resilient. Great, thank you very much, Sylvia. Yes, I would like to compliment a little on what Donna has said about democracy. I think that what I said about Colombia is a good example of that uh, democracy is, 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 is not always enough because of the, the populist uh, candidates that can come either right or left, but people that are elected in a democratic way, but have been there with not with the uh, based on fake news, based on an ignorance of many parts of the population. Uh, yeah, based on things that are promises that will never be kept. And so, so I think that that is important. And I think that we have to work together to make a better education and democratic education. We need people to understand what's in stake when you just don't read and just don't understand what promises that are unfounded could lead to. So that is very important in, in terms of democratic um, information and about climate change i was i was going to comment and this is a uh, more true now with the war uh, there is an increasing demand on energy and we will have to cope with that energy and we're seeing all the prices that have gone up we need in latin america for to have this energy transition, we need also uh, to stop deforestation in the Amazon region. We really have to work on that. That must be one of our priorities, not at Colombia or Brazil. We have to be a world a wide force to stop that. And we need to understand that to cope with climate change, it is not necessary to stop production of, 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 of oil. We have to do it in a better way. We have to do it in a way that we conserve the natural resources, but we cannot waste all the natural resources that we have under and that we need for education, we need for health, we need for all the social uh, needs that our people have. So I think that the energy transition is necessary, but it is not going to happen from one way to the other. So we need to do it right. Great, thank you very much. Um, Ambassador Shannon, any thoughts on any of these questions mm -hmm. or final reflections? Well, first of all, the questions themselves reflect the diversity of issues that the hemisphere is facing today and that the Summit of the Americas will be asked to address. And so I, I congratulate those who asked the questions. I'm sorry we have not been able to get to all of them because they were all interesting and, and would elucidate, I believe, aspects of policy in, in the hemisphere that would be important. I would just underscore as we look to the summit, uh, as has been noted, it's very important that the countries that come and participate in the summit leave with the feeling that not only have they had a chance to speak and be heard, but that as a hemisphere, we are beginning to focus on those things that are meaningful and relevant to the lives of our citizens. And that means focusing on uh, public health. It means focusing on the impact that COVID and the pandemic has had in our public health systems. It means focusing on education, focusing on youth, and focusing on economic growth and job creation so that people believe that there is reason to be hopeful as they look into the future and try to understand what their lives are going to be like. And as has been noted, uh, by Donna Reinach and others, um, this will be the test of democracy in our hemisphere. 
the test of democracy will be, can we deliver the goods? Can democratic governments deliver the goods? Uh, and in this sense, um, the leaders uh, of our hemisphere who will be meeting in Los Angeles carry a weighty responsibility. They have not lived up to that responsibility so far, but this will be the test. Thank you very much, um, President Chinchilla. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the questions. Um, an additional comment uh, concerning the summit. I will say that uh, something good would be to see a plan uh, for the region, uh, including the most important regional institutions. Uh, what is going to happen with a more active um, um, role coming from the um, uh, financial institutions, such as the IDB, the CAF, is it going to be a capital increase so they can really support uh, the uh, economic needs of uh, the countries, the infrastructure, uh, digital technologies, et cetera, et cetera. And also what is gonna happen with the role of the uh, Organization of American States concerning the defense of democracy, because we are in the, uh, uh, in the midst of commemoration of uh, the Inter-American uh, Democratic Charter too. So the role of those institutions is gonna be critical uh, in this summit. What is gonna happen with them and to bring some clear ideas and plans for the future of those institutions. And some comments to finalize, uh, concerning the, uh, the, uh, the uh, democracy issue. And uh, the, look, the region has a serious challenge of democratic governance, which so far has not been handled uh, well. In some cases, what we see is very simplistic solutions like hyper-presidentialism, something very common in our countries, and the weakening of controls of executive powers. Uh, which uh, finally uh, end up uh, harming democracy and the rule of law. So more presidentialism, concentrating of powers in the name of being more effective is not the solution. On the other side, we have some electoral reforms um, implemented with the aim uh, of opening politics to more participation. But those results, those reforms have resulted in more fragmentation and atomization of political parties, which is also hindering society's uh, capacity to collective uh, action. So this is the time when we have to share different experiences that are you know, being implemented more recently in the region, most of them encouraging participation, but not necessarily debilitating uh, the decision-making processes. One of the main challenges is going to be to do something about the educational blackout that the region suffered during these years because, and here is a very important data uh, that was brought by the uh, Latino Barometer 2020 report, which says that education is the main factor shaping generation of Democrats in the region. So living in a democracy is not sufficient to turn citizens into Democrats. So that means also that besides implementing the institutional reforms, we must take very seriously the issue of education. Thank you, uh, President Chinchilla. Um, uh, let me just uh, follow on that. Uh, as, as, you, as, as everybody will note in, in, the, um, in the report, one of the recommendations is really an emphasis on greater cooperation on education. And our education program at the Dialogue um, is working together with the World Bank and with UNICEF and UNESCO on a major initiative to try to recover uh, all that's been lost in education and really try to increase uh, political attention and resources um, to, because there has been, as, as you said, and as, as Tabata said in Brazil, it's really quite dramatic. And uh, if Latin America is really going to respond uh, and increase growth and, and, and uh, overcome poverty and equality and become more competitive, education is absolutely fundamental. So that's something that the dialogue is very committed to doing. And, and we're engaging with civil society, the private sector, and, and various governments that, that share that 
uh, that basic concern. Um, well, I think this has been a, you know, this has an, been an excellent, excellent uh, session. We've, uh, we, uh, th there's clearly a, a lot of issues that are in the report. We try to really um, cover a broad range. Um, they're all uh, separate, but all interconnected, I think, and interlinked. And, um, and um, I think as, uh, as Donna said, um, this is not the moment for ambitious brand initiatives. Uh, I think one has to be realistic, one has to be pra uh, modest and pragmatic, um, but there is room and space uh, to make progress, to advance on a number of these critical issues, and Bachelor Shannon, especially on the public health question, um, this pandemic is not over. There are going to be other health crises and emergencies that are coming. We all know that. And, you know, can we learn the lessons um, from this one? And uh, I think uh, a number of countries, including the United States, made some, some mistakes. And uh, really, I think that's an important challenge that we highlight in the report and is, is very, uh, is a critical recommendation as well. We've alluded to President Tucci, you're in Costa Rica where there where their elections uh, uh, on Sunday and um, and um, Sylvia talked about the election in uh, in Colombia and Tabata talked about the election in uh, in Brazil. It's coming up in October, very, very important for the region. And I just want to reiterate that the dialogue uh, has members with varied political perspectives and views um, and um, and we welcome um, people uh, at the dialogue in forums to talk talk about their different views uh, about, about the uh, elections and candidates and the political direction of their countries. But I think what all of the members of the dialogue have in common, and this, Sylvia stressed this, and I wanna underscore it to conclude from my perspective, is a, is a commitment to pluralism, to tolerance, to openness, um, and to the spirit of, of democracy, norms of democracy. And uh, we have our differences and we have our preferred candidates and those we like and we, those we don't like and policies we agree with, we don't agree with, but I think it goes much, and it goes in a much more profound way than that. So, um, so that, that I think is, I just wanna sort of make that point and um, I just want to reiterate my gratitude uh, to Tabata who's, 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 who's left us to Sylvia, for Donna for the really very thoughtful and, and insightful commentaries. And of course to my, my, my two bosses, um, still for another uh, week or so, um, um, Ambassador Shannon and, and President Chichia for their really uh, commitment uh, to the dialogue, commitment to the values and the mission of the dialogue, and their, their generous and unstitting un support uh, to me and to the rest of the dialogue team. We're very, very grateful to you. And uh, I have every, I, I know, I'm absolutely sure that the dialogue will continue uh, to move forward on a lot of these issues, engaging new voices, new perspectives, new members, under new leadership. And um, I know it, it's gonna to continue to be a very, very important and successful uh, inter-American independent forum. So with that, uh, I urge everybody to, uh, to look at the report. The conversation doesn't end here. Um, if you have comments and questions, feel free to contact the commentators, the co-chairs, me, anybody else in the dialogue. And um, we don't want, we wanna sort of keep this, uh, debate and discussion alive uh, going forward. I think it's healthy and important uh, to build a better future for everybody in the Americas. So thank you all very, very much. Stay well, take care, and uh, we'll, And thank you all for joining us. We had well over 100 participants, uh, great questions, and I think this has been a very interesting and successful uh, event. So thanks to everybody and take good care.